Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Forget Wall Street, AIG, and G20. Of these, we've heard plenty. Don't think about David, Shelley, Malcolm, and Mike. Rather, A-Rod, Derek, CC, Jabba, and the like. Santana, Rays, Wright, and Sheffield, too. City Field and Yankee Stadium. Again this year, the other Bronx Zoo. To talk baseball, Yankees and the Mets, too, are two of the premier New York sports writers of the last half century, Maury Allen and Phil Pepe, two Isaac Asimovs of sports writing. Maury was Yankee beat writer and columnist for the New York Post and, the, and is the author of over three dozen books about baseball, most recently Yankees World Series Memories. Phil, former Yankee beat writer for the New York World Telegram and Sun and the Daily News, has written four dozen books, including the just-published Few and Chosen, Defining Mets Greatness Across the Era with Rusty Staub. I grew up a Yankee addict, and these two guys were among my suppliers. I've read their books and reveled in their tales. Welcome back, Maury. Welcome back, Thank Phil. You. What have they done to the game? Is it the same game? Do you enjoy the game as much as you did? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Love the game. Always will, always have. Uh, the game hasn't changed. Still, still nine innings. It's still 60 feet, six inches. It's still 90 feet between the bases. That part of it hasn't changed. It's all the entrapments surrounding it that's changed. Talk about the entrapments <laughs> and what, what what annoys you about noise, the modern noise. baseball. Noise. <laughs> noise. You said it. Noise. Right, noise. <laughs> In between innings, noise. Yeah, and also the concepts of uh, uh, pitch counts and, and uh, uh, quality starts, things like that. I mean, we had a game in which Johan Santana pitched opening day. And... You read the papers the next day, he was uh, unhittable, he was, you rave about him. Now, let me ask you a question. What do you think we would have been writing or saying if Bob Gibson, uh, Sandy Koufax, Whitey Ford. Whitey Ford pitched five and two-thirds innings and then left? Had a bad game. Yeah, exactly. Come on, you know, you go, those guys were finishers. Maury. I think the factor in all of this is that the relief pitches have become so significant in the game and you're paying them 15 and 20 and 25 million dollars, you got to get them into the game, even if Santana is going to pitch a great game, even if any starter is going to pitch a great game. You have to use these guys or else they're going to say, why did I sign this contract? I want to play, I want to pitch also. And I think that's probably the most significant game, uh, change in the game over our time over the last you know, 40, 50 years, the use of the bullpen and the way the managers depend on it. And most managers, when you talk to them today, will say when you're building a team, you build from the back to the front. The back meaning start out with a closer, get a guy that can get you through, through the eighth inning, have another guy that can handle maybe the seventh inning if you need him, and then worry about your starting pitches. And that's not... The game that you guys covered or I grew up with, the starter pitched nine innings. No, exactly. And, and if he didn't pitch nine innings, as you suggested, there was something wrong here. Yeah, complete, complete games are pretty much a thing of the past. Right. Uh, shutouts, you know, you're not going to see. If, if you get seven complete games out of a starter, I mean, he, that's a Cy Young award. Yeah, Grover Cleveland Alexander, I think, uh, pitched 90 shutouts in his in his <laughs> career. <laughs> 90 shutouts. You're going to have a pitcher pitch 90 complete games anymore. But Maury's right. A guy pitches a shutout for eight innings, comes a night, and, you know, and didn't expend a lot of effort because maybe he made less than 100 pitches. Sure. Comes the ninth inning, in comes the, the closer. And if you don't bring him in, then the owner says, why are we paying this guy $15 million if, yeah. if you're not going to use what, him? I think what you have to understand about baseball is that it's a very dynamic game. I mean, they started playing it maybe in the Civil War days in 1860 or something like that, and they threw a ball on the field and people ran you know, around the, what were bases in those days. 
and they the game itself i mean as phil said the game itself the playing of the game on the field really hasn't changed very much it's the accoutrements that have changed it's the stadiums it's the prices you pay the players it's the <laughs> prices you pay level. for beer what, what is it nine defend. bucks a beer yeah. in Yankee, i was at uh, city field right for the first i haven't time. been have take, you been to you through the two take a look at city field what city field is in my opinion is a huge picnic area I don't think anybody's coming to watch the game. I think they're coming to sit in these gigantic lounges on huge couches, on huge reclining chairs, eating a you know a twelve dollar hot dog and a nine drinking a nine dollar beer and watching a game on TV. It's a social event. It's a connection. Maybe they'll sit in the seats, you know, when the weather's wonderful, they'll sit out there for three or four innings. But every fan who goes to the ballpark now, Yankee Stadium and City Field, will use these lounge restaurant eating areas, and that's really what baseball has become. It's like they're, they're entertainment centers. They're not ballparks. No, true. There, it's, there are exceptions, but most people who go to the game, I mean, the, the average fan can't afford to go to, to a game. Please, the guy who's going because he wants to watch the game. Right, he's he's being phased out. So corporations and uh, it's a place to be. It's a thing to do, and you'll see celebrities and you'll see uh, Wall Street executives there, and they'll have well, fewer well, than that than not, not anymore, I guess. <laughs> and they'll have parties, and it'll be enter entertainment for uh, clients and that sort of thing. Not like the old days when you decide, I want to go to a game. You walk up to the booth, you buy yourself a ticket, maybe the best seat in the house, right. and you watch your baseball game. Right. Can't do that anymore. Well, I remember as a kid, we, we'd spend the weekend at Yankee mm -hmm. Stadium, a buck and a half in the upper right field seats, yeah. nosebleeds. You know, when, when people talk about the prices of the old days when we were growing up in, in Brooklyn, you also have to recognize the way the salary structures of today are. I mean, my father never made a hundred dollars a week as a salesman, and we still could go to Ebbets Field for fifty cents right. or a dollar and a quarter if we got a big seat. Now everybody average salary is forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars, whatever it is, and so the price you're paying for everything is much more but when you get into this season and certainly when you get to the playoffs in the world series you really care about who's going to win the game and especially as a stay at home fan watching it on television you could be a lot more emotional in your living room you know with your pals than you might be sitting in a ballpark so the prices to me i mean people say how can they pay Ball players twenty, twenty-five million dollars. How can they pay actors twenty-five million dollars? How can these uh, corporate giants, you know, with the bailouts, make twenty-five and fifty and a hundred million dollars? So that's not a register of what the game is. I, I think the most significant thing about baseball on the field, the playing of the game, <clears throat> is pretty much the same as it's ever been. And there are two measures of that that I think prove the point. It's always been a standard that if a guy hit 300, he was a great hitter. That was in 1905 when Ty Cobb did it, and it's the same thing in 2009. For pitchers, if they won 20 games in 1905, they were pretty good pitchers. If they win 20 games in 2009, they're still pretty good pitchers. So I think the measures of the success of the game have really stayed the same. Mm -mm. Go. Oh, no, 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 oh no, good, no, good. No, no, tell no, no, him. No, tell no. him no. You're, you're full of it, Mark. The, guy, the guy wins 15 games, and they yeah. say he had a great year. A great year for winning mm -hmm. 15 and 8, 16 and 8. He had a great year. If Bob Gibson was 16 and 8, what would they be saying? <laughs> if Sandy Koufax won 16 mm -hmm. games, mm -hmm. what a disappointment. Now, I understand that was a fourth man rotation. They got more starts and all that. But the numbers are all skewed. It's not the way it used to be. You needed to pitch complete games. You needed to pitch innings. 300 innings was the norm. Now 200 innings is the norm. And you have a pitch count. And you have and automatic. I, and I mean, that's if you why pitch I'm rooting for the Texas Rangers this year. It's my okay. favorite team. Okay. Because I just found out. I just heard that. <laughs> 
the uh, owner, the president of the Texas Rangers, Nolan Ryan, has abolished pitch counts throughout the entire organization. Why? What is the pitch count? I mean, is that to get to the relief pitches, or is it? Or are they so fragile? I, I, that think, I think the idea was to save pitches' arms, and theoretically, they would do that with a pitch count. But I, I recall a story to Warren Spahn, you know, one of the greatest pitches of all time, said he never went one day in his entire professional life without throwing a baseball. Jim Cott and, says the same thing. Right. He throws every day. They pitched in the wintertime. Whatever it was, they went in some gym. It was 30 degrees below zero. You know, the snow was 10 feet on the ground. But you threw a baseball, and he said, that's the way your arm stayed strong. And I think the idea of a pitch count may lead eventually, or maybe it already has, to more of these pitches, you know, coming up short, having injuries, having Tommy John surgery and all the rest of it. But I think it's an unnatural act. Whitey Ford once said, if God wanted to create pitches, your arm would be hanging high in the air instead of down like this. But the game has changed significantly in that regard that you've got pitch counts and yeah, that aspect of the game. What about changed. what about the designated hitter? Well, it hasn't really changed the game. It's just changed the the strategy the lineups and a little bit of know, the strategy, strategy surrounding the game. But the game, the way it's played, the, the skills that are required, the plays that have to be made, all of that, none of that has changed. You know, speed is still important. Uh, like I said, still nine innings, still three outs, still four balls and th three strikes. All of that is the same. Uh, it's it's just all the other things that go along with it. I know. We we, we were talking off camera about the the noise, you know, the mm. train races and the music. <laughs> that you know, if there's you know, if a bat is up and there's one out and there's a guy on second base, those silences are really important because there's all this stuff going on. And Maury, you said you could talk to the guy next to you. you yeah, can't I think do that part anymore. of part of baseball is a kid. I grew up in Brooklyn, went to Ebbets Field 10 times a year, sat in the bleachers, 55 cents. The idea was you went with your brother, you went with one of your classmates, one of your friends when I was 12, 13 years old. In those days, you could ride the subway. Nobody, Your mother didn't worry that you'd be murdered if you rode the subway. So you rode the subway to Ebbets Field, you went to the game. And the idea was to talk about the play right. after it was over. If Duke Snyder ran to the wall, climbed the wall, made a great catch, for the next 15 minutes, you did two things. You talked about the play, and you also said, when we play tomorrow, I'll make the same catch. You don't have that now. You've got all of this It's all entertainment. It's entertainment now. It's, uh, people feel that they, there's a need to entertain you while you're being entertained. Right, and constantly. <laughs> Is the game enough entertainment? No, I guess not. I, I, I think it's all part of, of the change in American um, lifestyle. I mean, the music, beginning in the uh, 60s, you know, rock and roll takes over. The Beatles take over. I wouldn't go in 1964 to watch this group of uh, guys play music at uh, Shea Stadium, known as the Beatles, because I said, oh, that's a bunch of noise. Who's going to listen to that? Who's going to care about that, you know, next year? Well, I was wrong. <laughs> I've been wrong a lot of times. But anyway, that was wrong. But that that's part well, of the well, change wait, 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 in America. No, no, no. You cannot be wrong with what your taste is. It's not a matter of wrong. It's a matter of personal taste. Right. I still don't <laughs> go listen to the Beatles. I oh. still listen to... Uh, Charlie Parker and, right. and Miles Davis. And I'm not getting into this generational <laughs> thing with you two well, guys. But it's true. No, I right. Mean, it, it, there's no such thing as right or wrong yeah. about your taste. Mm -hmm. Right. This is what I enjoy. Yeah. I'm entitled to enjoy and I, what I, I think like. the kids today that, that go to a ballpark, I mean, the evidence is the attendance is growing. The uh, ratings are, uh, you know, growing. That means that people enjoy the ambience the of the The difference is we can get it on television free. So to get people to go to the ballpark, they have to offer more than what we're right. seeing okay. on television. Now, we were talking earlier about the joys of minor league baseball. The, For example, the the, the field in Oneonta, New York, where it's, it's a different ambiance. I, I don't go to major league baseball anymore. I go to minor league baseball. Whoa. The part of the attendance surge is not at the major league mm -hmm. level, but it's at the minor uh, uh, league uh, level. Uh, 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 I uh, disagree. Uh, see, hey, go ahead, Phil. The Yankees draw 
four no, million I know. people right. a year. They never, that was unheard of 20 years ago. Okay. There was a time when, if they drew, I remember the time when drawing a million was a yeah. successful yeah. thing. Then they got to two million. Yeah, yeah. That one, you, know, you figure that had that was the ultimate. No, no, people are coming to major league attendance is higher than it's ever been. How could you say that? People are not staying away from those games. They might this year because the economy is so bad. And the whole thing, it's all money-driven, too, and pitch counts are all money-driven. They pay so much money to these players, even the minor leaguers. They get so much money in, so if a bonuses, signing bonuses, that they, tr they feel they need to protect them so they don't break down and... They lose their investment. These are major. These are major yeah, investments. Yeah. I think also minor league baseball gives the fan a connection with the game that you don't have. Yeah, in, I guess maybe that's league what league I was baseball. talking about. The rather idea, than numbers, the feel. Yeah, the idea that yeah. you can go to a ballpark that holds five thousand people and sit against the stands, and I've done this with my grandchildren a little park in New Jersey we go to the game and you know they go against the rail and they get the players to sign and they're right on top of everything and they yell at the players and it's an intimate and the minor league players my experience not only when I was working but even to this day is minor league players love a little bit of attention so when they get that attention they're pretty joyous about it and they're pretty cooperative about it until they get to the big leagues and they're making 20 million and they tell you to take off when you want to talk to them but you know some of them do some of them don't but in the minor leagues every player is, is pretty cooperative the game is fun the intimacy of the park is fun and the idea that you can spend a day <clears throat> with your family at a minor league ballpark for 30 40 50 bucks as compared to three four five hundred right. at a major league park is a big difference do you root do you root for a team now no well yeah it, to some extent i root i uh, I root for teams. I root for individuals. Okay. And often I will root for the team that I that. <clears throat> well, I have a son who's an agent. Okay. And so I root for his clients. Oh, come on! I mean, Good dad. Yeah, right. Come on! <laughs> Why not? And so if he has a client on a particular team, I want to see the team do well. Secondarily to have seeing him do well. Right. Right. Uh, that's that's the thing. When I was covering. I didn't root for teams. I root for individuals or I root for stories. I root for uh, a good story. I like to see players who I, I like personally. I like to see them do well. And I also like to see players who were good talkers and would help me do my job, let them have a good game and win so that when the game is over, I can interview him and get a better story. Talk about two good talkers and maybe two bad talkers. Well, I have favorites. I guess we all have favorites. Uh, one of my favorites was Sparky Lyle. He was he was terrific, and G Gossage was another one. Goose Gossage was was excellent. Uh, in the old days, you know, Mickey Mantle was not so good. Roger Maris was not so good. And I take exception to the people who said, I mean, Billy Crystal's '61 was all erroneous. We didn't root against Roger Maris. Why would I root against Roger Maris? Right. Why would I not want to cover a man who's going to break a record? And I would be a witness to that. Right. Wouldn't I want? That's a great story. It's great to be to be part of that. Uh, but Roger was a difficult guy to cover. I mean, Maury will agree to that. Not th I didn't dislike Roger, but he wasn't a good t mm. talker. He, you, you Derek know Jeter, I gather. I don't know Derek no. Jeter. He doesn't give doesn't the talk. right as doesn't. anything. No. One of the things that sometimes we forget as, as sports writers, the ball players, except for their particular skill of being able to hit or throw a baseball, are the same as the rest of us. And there are a lot of baseball players who are not good conversationalists. They do their job. Roger Maris is a classic. They do their job. They do it well. They're proud of what they do. They want to support their families. This is in a day when, you know, $50,000 was a big salary. But we, our selfish sports writer selves, we want the guy to be colorful and funny and entertaining. And I want to write great stories about him. I want my boss to say, what a wonderful story. Roger Maris and people like Roger Maris never did that. I'll give you a great example of how this worked. My favorite team, the one I re rooted for, <clears throat> uh, 
of all time teams, other than the Dodgers as a kid, was the 69 Mets. They had a collection of entertaining and funny and amusing and, and articulate guys on that team. No matter who you went to after the game, you always had a good story. And the best guy on the team, talking-wise, was Ron Swoboda. Not a great player, right. but made the famous catch. And but what, the 60 against Minnesota, the 65 World Series? No, 69 slide? World Series. 69 World Series. Caught, uh, right, against Baltimore. Uh, yeah, caught the uh, I'm losing ball. it. You get, you're smiling <laughs> Frank because Robinson. I'm losing yeah, it. Yeah, 69. Right. But anyway, there was a game, a doubleheader that the Mets played, and they split the doubleheader. And after the game was over, Swoboda struck out five times in a doubleheader. And after the game was over, you go up to him and you kind of uh, you know, sympathetic to what he went through, and you say, well, oh, you had a tough day, and, you know, tomorrow will be another day, and who's pitching tomorrow, whatever you say. And he, his line was, it's a good thing we won one of the two games. If we didn't, I'd be eating my heart out. As it is, I'm only eating out my right ventricle. So when a guy says something like that, you write it down, you know you got a cute little anecdote, but it expresses the kind of emotion that ball players go through. Casey Stengel, my all-time baseball hero, once said to me, how would you like it if there was a box score next to every story you wrote in the paper? And they wrote, Maury wrote a story today, but it wasn't a very good story, and he was one for four in writing this story. Ball players live with that. That's one of the things that makes them very unique. Their public failures and their public successes are out there for everybody to examine. And I also like <laughs> to see teams that are undercapitalized. Yeah, talk about that. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, I, that's why I. Well, I mean, we have here. We've got. Uh, CC and uh, Mark well, that was 300, wonderful 300 million dollars and 0 for, 0, for, 0 for 4 with five men left on well, base I, I think and they, somebody they, battered. That, you know, they air statistics for everything and I think that they should have included in the box score yesterday that the Baltimore Orioles payroll of Sixty-two million defeated the New York Yankees with payroll of three hundred million by the score of ten to five. <laughs> okay, okay. Why not? okay. I, I think the great example of that was uh, Florida last year. You know, a very Tampa Bay. Excuse me, Tampa Bay. Yeah. Tampa Bay. Right. Yeah. I get my Floridas mixed up. But when you take a team like that that didn't have any star players and didn't have any high salary players, you know, and they get to the to the World Series, I mean, that's an accomplishment of the organization, the manager, the players, and all the rest of it. And I think generally fans do root. And I think we identify, as Phil said, with the underdog. When, whenever you go to a game, if you don't have an emotional connection with one of the teams, I mean, even a game you watch on TV, whether it's baseball, basketball, football, whatever it is, you automatically root for the team that isn't supposed to win. And when that team surprises and wins, it's a kick because that's what life is really all about. We're living in an environment where, you know, the pressures of everyday life are very difficult. And when you succeed as an underdog, it's it's quite an accomplishment. Well, fans don't think that way. Go ahead. I mean, you listen to talk radio. They don't think that way. The Yankee fans want... Excess. They want all the stars. They want to sign every major, every great player. <laughs> they want you know, the all-star Of course team. they do. And I'm not criticizing the Yankees for doing it. They're playing within the rules. It's the rules that need to be changed. There, there probably has to be a... Uh, I shouldn't be saying this. You know, you I don't my, my, say it. That's my why son is an agent. I'm, gonna, the, I'm costing him money. Say it right now. <laughs> say it right there now. Should, there should be a salary cap. Right. Uh, it, it, it's it's just not fair. Why should one team be allowed to to spend almost three hundred million dollars on its roster, and another team is lucky to be able to spend fifty million? But then, don't you get the psychic satisfaction like you you, you did when Baltimore beat sure, them ten five? Sure, but it's not going to happen often enough. Okay. When is Baltimore ever going to win again? When is Cincinnati mm. going to win again? Win a World Series? Pittsburgh. You, you know, Pittsburgh. Uh, Phil, it's, it's interesting, and if you think back to our days as a kid growing up in Brooklyn. 
there were only three or four teams that won every year in those days. I mean, it was the Dodgers and the Giants and, and the Cardinals in the National League. The Phillies never won. You know, Pittsburgh never won. Uh, you know, Boston before they moved to Milwaukee. Phillies won in, in uh, 50. 50. Yeah, but I mean, for a long time, these teams were down, and you always expected the same But you could build your team every year. up, and you can hold on to And I'm not saying that it's the right thing. I, you know, I, I do believe in the free agency. I believe that players have a right to earn as much money as they can. I mean, that's the, they have a service to perform. They deserve to get paid for that service. But in those days, you could build a team up, and you could hold on to those players mm. and have a, a little bit of a mini dynasty. <clears throat> now what happens is... To share as a great player, the Yankees come in and scoop agent. him up. Yeah. Uh, Sabathia is mm -hmm. a great pitcher. The Yankees come in and scoop him up. And I'm not mm -hmm. picking on the Yankees, but mm -hmm. they're the ones who... The most outrageous example. Yeah. I think it's all part of... Uh, George Steinbrenner, to me, is the ultimate baseball fan, the ultimate Yankee fan. And the definition of that, George Steinbrenner thinks it's a great season, did when he was involved, if the Yankees win 162 and 0. That was his goal every season. You don't think his Win goal was to build a team up so it's now worth a billion dollars? <laughs> Wasn't that part of the goal? <laughs> I, and you know, frankly, you winning was the only thing. I, I don't. I don't think he cared as much about the money as he cared about winning. Oh, I really okay. don't. All yeah. right. I really don't. Phil's not buying. <laughs> yeah. Buying the fan argument. Yeah. He's buying the capitalist argument. Okay. Last words. This season, predictions. I, I think it's it's. Hey, we we always did it. We do it every year. We make predictions in the Do it. I can't. How do I know? Tell me. I have no idea. Oh, I'm no, asking no. you. I, you. You need to explain to me what are the rosters going to look like in August. It's not going to be Who the same. Hurt? Who gets hurt? What deals are made? We don't know. Does A-Rod come back? Uh, does he come <laughs> back? But if the Yankees suddenly need a couple of more players, are they going to make deals and, and pick them? Well, they used to do that with they Kansas City. They, they always got it. They yeah. should. At the low yeah. All I'm saying is that we were always forced into making predictions in April on what's going to happen in Where? September. How, is, how do I know? If I had a crystal ball who would only tell me what the rosters consisted of, I'd have an opportunity to, t to you want to they take always, a shot at yeah, this? They always say you don't judge a team on paper. But when you look at the paper of the Yankees and the Mets, you see two teams that have a pretty good chance to win it. And my feeling is they're both going to win it in the new stadiums. That's going to be part of the environment, part of the excitement. And I see a seven-game World Series with the Mets finally beating the Yankees. Oh, you guys are coming back, right? <laughs> Together. You yes? <laughs> no? You're coming back. Yeah, well, Only okay. if there's a seven-game World Series. Oh, no, you got to come Yankees. back before that. Thank you. <laughs>